2003 to 2011, I served a, a church in Coventryville, Pennsylvania. You may not have heard of that before, but it was cleverly named Coventryville United Methodist Church. Coventryville UMC uh, is in northern Chester County, but it's really near Pottstown. It's almost Montgomery County there. In some ways, Coventryville reminds me of rules of our church and our community here. It was a little bit of a destination church like we are, meaning it's kind of a little bit off the beaten path, surrounded largely by a, a rural setting. There's scattering of houses here, little development there, but, but lots, of, uh, lots of farms, lots of open ground, lots of woods uh, in between, a couple little towns nearby. You know, when you see a church set apart like this, you wonder, well, how did that ever get there? Well, the, the, the town of Coventryville made it on the map because back in the 1700s, there was iron discovered in them there hills. And so there were iron furnaces that were, were, were built up. Again, it reminds me a little bit about Mannheim here. Iron furnaces were built to process the iron ore. The family that uh, built those furnaces built up a community around the furnaces to support the business. Early on, that family entered into a business arrangement with a guy by the name of Ben Franklin. Yeah, that, that Ben, Mr. Post Office, Mr. Key on the kite and electricity and go to France there to try to iron things out for the, for the, the colonies at war with England. Uh, they entered into a relationship with Franklin there and they built uh, Ben Franklin stoves. I don't know, any of you ever heard of a, of a Franklin stove? You can find replicas of those today, um, but uh, the original Ben Franklin stoves, every single one of them was cast in those three furnaces there that uh, made up the, the community, the center of the community. So uh, a little bit later on, um, war breaks out. There's a pesky little war in the 1700s you might have heard of, right? The Revolutionary War, 1776, etc. And, and, and notable, uh, notable when, when the war broke out is that uh, it, it's documented that Washington and some of his officers, some of the staff would come from Valley Forge when they were uh, holed up for the winter there. They would come up to Coventry and they would uh, enjoy the hospitality of the ladies of Coventry there that uh, got the church going. So it was really kind of a cool thing to think about walking out in front of the church there. This street here, this is a street with these historic buildings, you know, Ben Franklin walked down this street. George Washington walked down this street. Well, when war broke out, it was more than just a connection that Washington came to visit. The furnaces switched from making stoves to they started making cannonballs for the Continental Army. You know, if you are a, a, an expert or if you uh, have any interest in, in history or you just remember a little bit of those lessons from way back when, one of the huge factors in the outbreak of war between the colonists and England was taxes. Taxation without representation was horrible. Oh my goodness. It was a huge, huge issue. You know, taxes were just as popular then and just as divisive then as I think that they are now. And it turns out taxes are just as popular and divisive then as now as they were in Jesus' day. In Jesus' time, there were revolts over taxes. Revolts would happen every few years. Somebody would really get upset and they would gather a few followers and they'd try to do something and enforce their will. That never ended well. When someone would revolt about taxes and, and gather three or four or a hundred people around them, the Roman legion would come in or the Roman garrison would come in and would squash it. It would squash them hard. That usually meant blood. The worst, the worst of those revolts and the worst uh, response to that came after Jesus. But before Matthew probably wrote this very gospel we're going to look at today, and that particular revolt led to a war that lasted from 66 A.D. to 70 A.D. It ended with Jerusalem overrun, overrun by the Romans. 
historians describe how blood ran in the streets to a staggering level. There's some historians that talk about blood running in the streets to the depth of, a, of, the, of the breast of a horse. It's just unbelievable the, the way it's described. Uh, in addition to all of the, the killing and the bloodshed that happened, the final result of that revolt there over taxes was that finally, ultimately, the temple is destroyed. It is, it is an incredibly um, defining moment for the, 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 the folks of Israel there. In, in fact, to this day, the date that the city was attacked and the date that the walls fell and the date that the temple itself was destroyed are still commemorated to this day as days of deep, deep, deep sorrow and sadness. To say that taxes are a touchy subject is an understatement. Taxes for the Israelites were an incredibly touchy subject. But it is taxes that are at the center of our passage that we have for today. I'm going to read for you, and I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, open them up. Just keep it open so you can follow along. I'm going to read for you Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 15 to 22. Matthew 22, 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied, then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, what we have here today on the surface seems like a pretty simple, straightforward story. We have Jesus in or near the temple. That's important. We should note that here. This is the final week. It's leading up to his, his, his crucifixion. We have Jesus in or near the temple, surrounded, of course, by a crowd of, of folks. And, and in, come, uh, the, in come Pharisees and Herodians to confront him. And it reminds me maybe what we see here today a little bit in our own political discourse. It reminds me modern situations of modern political debate or town hall or interview. Jesus here, surrounded by the crowds, confronted by the Pharisees and Herodians, gets hit with a gotcha question. The idea here is that we want to trap Jesus. We want him to slip up and say something that we can use against him. And that's the gist of what we have here today. Simple enough. Until you dig a little bit deeper. Digging a little bit deeper and really trying to get underneath this story. First thing we should note. First thing we should note here that th this attempt to trap Jesus. To get him to say something. To get him to kind of hang himself a little bit. Brings together a set of strange bedfellows. Now the Pharisees we know. Pharisees we have some familiarity with. Pharisees were a strict religious sect. They practiced rigorous obedience to the law, and they were just about as equally concerned to see it rigorously observed and obeyed by others. They really like to tell others, this is what you should do, and this is how you should do it. Why aren't you doing it this way? And really hold others accountable to follow the law the way that they thought and understood that the law should be followed. Pharisees are nationalists. They are uh, very, very loyal to Israel. They are looking for the day that God is going to rescue them. They are looking for how God is going to restore them as a people. Um, but they're also quietists. Pharisees were not known for rocking the boat. They were not the ones 
who would start the revolts. They enjoyed their power a little too much. They enjoyed power and probably a measure of respect, even if that was partly out of fear. People didn't want to have the Pharisees bugging them for the way that they were following their faith. These Pharisees, they did want to see things change. They were interested in seeing Israel elevated. They wanted to see things change, but they were pretty cautious about it. The Herodians, the Herodians were a little bit different. And we don't know very much about the Herodians. They're only mentioned in the Bible three times. There's, there's three references to the Herodians. We have the reference here. The Pharisees send their disciples along with the Herodians to confront Jesus. We have the Herodians mentioned in Mark chapter 12, verse 13, where, uh, unsurprisingly, it is Mark sharing the exact same story. Mark recorded that story just as Matthew records it, so the Herodians are mentioned there. And we have the Herodians mentioned in Mark chapter 3, verse 6. It's the first reference to the Herodians when Pharisees went to the Herodians to try to see if they could uh, work something out that together they could deal with the chaos and the upset that Jesus was causing them. The Herodians, what we do understand, they, they were more of a political sect. If the Pharisees were a, a religious sect, the Herodians were more of a political sect. You might even say political groupies. They supported the Herodian line of, of kings, of rulers, which uh, really would take them back to uh, Herod the Great. Right now, when Jesus is, is having this encounter, when Matthew is writing, what that means is they are supportive of Herod Antipas, who really ruled under Pilate and who really ruled in Galilee, not in Jerusalem. So these Herodians here that come before Jesus are a little bit out of their place in Jerusalem. They're probably there right now at this time because it's just before what will be the Passover. But, but they are a little out of place. It's still, they're, they're opportunists. If they can deal with Jesus here in Jerusalem, well, that's just well and good, and it'll help them out back at home, and, and they've got this thing taken care of. Now, this group, this strange group, comes before Jesus, and on the surface, uh, it looks really nice. There's a whole lot of flattery going on. They're coming to Jesus with flattery on their lips. In verse 16, in verse 16, we read, this, this is how they came. As a teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity. How many of you would like, you know, and, and, and what would it feel like? Somebody come, John, I know that you're a man of integrity. Bruce, I know that you're a man of integrity. Bruce is shaking his head and smiling. I mean, it's that, it's that kind of thing. You know, it feels good. The, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians are coming to Jesus. It sounds, oh, so sweet. We know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. In other words, you're your own man and you're above reproach. You, you're something special. So this is how they come. They're, they're flattering Jesus, but they don't believe what they're saying for a minute. These folks are far from pure as they confront Jesus. And we see that in a number of ways, from what is described here to the way that Jesus uh, interacts with them. First thing we see that there's a little bit of guile going on is the Pharisees don't come themselves. They send their disciples to go and do the deed. You think about that. Why is it that they wouldn't come themselves? If the Pharisees are so concerned about dealing with Jesus, why wouldn't they come? Well, maybe a couple things. Maybe by sending their disciples, the ones that are learning under them, they think to put Jesus a little bit at ease. Like These are not the ones that like really, 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 really know every little jot and tittle of the law. We may be you know, not going to have to get really, really intense about this. And, and maybe too, the Pharisees sending their own disciples, it gives them a little bit of a buffer between Jesus and, and the Pharisees. Think about it. How many times did Pharisees or Sadducees or priests or somebody come to Jesus and want to trick him up, had some kind of question, they think they had him, they're, they're, they're accusing almost every single time Jesus got out of it. Nobody. 
Nobody laid a glove on Jesus. So maybe the Pharisees think, oh shoot, this is not going well before. Let's send our disciples here and see what, you know, maybe, who knows. In addition to this, though, what makes it really plain, really clear that the, these, this group uh, was far from pure in their motives or intentions, Jesus sees through it right away. Jesus sees through it completely. If you have your Bible open, verse 18, Jesus, uh, Jesus is responding to them after they set him up and they ask their question. Jesus, it says in verse 18, knowing their evil intent says. We'll get to what he says in a moment. But he recognizes their intent. Now, Jesus, knowing their evil intent, the word here that's used for evil in some of your translations might be translated as malice. This is the same Greek word that you find in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Anybody know what you find in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13? You find something that we just prayed together. This is the word that's used when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. And he gives them the example. He gives them the model. Uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. Jesus, knowing their evil intent, recognizes, recognizes that uh, there's, there's something rotten going on here. And there are, more, there are even more sinister connections that we could make uh, with this, this word evil, the, the evil intent that Jesus recognized, but we're going to just leave it at that. He recognizes their intent, their, their impure intent. And, and this is further noted in the way that he responds to them. He didn't just recognize it, but in the way that he responds, it becomes clear that Jesus did recognize it, and he's calling it out. If you are in verse 18, he continues, and when he addresses them, he says, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. And this word literally means someone who's play acting. So they come play acting. They come playing like, hey, we're serious. We'd like to know. We're curious. What do you say? We're really interested. But deep down, they're not. They're not. The questioners were acting curious, but deep down, they're really filled with an evil intent, with bitterness. They're just waiting to pounce. One little, last little aspect of this really helps us to see just how evil this intent is, how off it is. Uh, Jesus then asks him, he says, you hypocrites, he asks them, why are you trying to trap me? Why are you trying to trap me? Now that word trap, it's often translated as test. The Greek root, the, the, the root of this word, what it means in its fullest extent, its most basic extent, is to solicit evil. Jesus is asking them, why are you trying to get evil out of me? Why are you trying to get evil out of me? Jesus is being tested by more than a question here. Jesus is being tested by evil. Plain and simple. If this was a movie, if we were in a movie right now, the music in the background would be eerie and it would be suggestive. We know that bad things are afoot. We'd be clenching our arm rests in the movie theater because it's, this is just wrong. It's just wrong. And, and, and we have the question itself. We come to the question itself, the, the issue, the tax. Now, Everybody knew that something was coming when they see the Herodians and the, the disciples of the Pharisees coming. Everybody knows something's coming when they see them coming, starting to circle, starting to flatter. But here it is, evident to all that, that what is up. The trap is clear. We have a question that's posed oh so innocently, so properly. Hey, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Coming as the question comes from the ones that it comes from in the setting that it comes from, this question really means, is it in accordance with God's will? Because that's the only thing that the Pharisees were concerned about. Are we following God's will? Are we living God's will? Are we practicing God's will? The question really means, is, is paying the tax... The imperial tax, the tax to Caesar, in accordance with God's will. Does it square with who we are as a people, with our scripture, with God's word? Now, the Pharisees and the Herodians, 
concocting this little, this little thing here expect that it should be a yes or a no answer, which will ultimately be either offensive or treasonous. A yes answer to this is going to be offensive to every self-respecting Jew, every person who believed in Israel as God's chosen special people, every person there that believed that God is the ruler and Rome is some kind of oppressing usurper. A no, a no, it's, it, 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 it's not okay, is going to maybe make them happy, but it will be treasonous and put Jesus at odds with those Romans who impose the tax. Either way, the Herodians, the Pharisees, they expect that Jesus is going to put himself at odds with many. He's going to end up in danger with a problem from this question. Now, let's just pause here a minute. Why all the fuss over a simple tax? I mean, I get it. I don't like paying taxes. Dave, do you like paying taxes? Nah, Eddie, do you like paying taxes? Who here likes paying taxes? None of us love, but we pay all kinds of taxes, and there's a lot of taxes we pay, we don't even think about it. When you stop to get gas in your car, you're thinking, man, oh day, look how much tax there is. Now, when you go out to buy that new pair of shoes or a book or whatever it is, you know, grass seed, are you thinking, gee whiz, look at all that tax. Maybe when you're buying a car, you might think about it, but we pay all kinds of taxes that we don't even think about. This tax... It's a single denarii, one time per year. Really, not that much. And there were other taxes in Jesus' day imposed by Rome, ones that felt far more onerous than this. There was the ground tax that taxed what a person grew. If your livelihood was, was grain or grapes or olives, you would get taxed on that 10%, 20% or more. There was an income tax that, well, it was tax on your income. If you were a carpenter or a stonemason or some kind of merchant, you got taxed on your income. These taxes Taxes were anywhere from 10 to 20 percent if your tax collector was honest. Because if your tax collector was not honest, they might say, well, John, here's what it is, but I'm not going to clear this on the books unless you give me, you know. And that was how tax collectors often uh, made a little money and padded themselves. They charged more. So, you know, you can get if people are upset with the ground tax and the income tax, but this is just, it's a simple poll tax. It, it, it's really just a simple census matter. Every male between 14 years old and 65 years old has to pay one denarii per year. So what? Well, much like colonists in America took issue with what particular taxes represented, the Jews took issue with this tax above others. And it was the way that it had to be paid, and it was what it represented that made it so represent, reprehensible. Now the way that it was to be paid was simple enough. You had to give a silver Roman denarius. The problem was, and, and the issue that many Jews had with this, is this coin was minted by Rome, and it had on it the image of Caesar. In this time, it would have been Caesar Tiberius. And there were words on this coin, along with the image, to the effect, Tiberius Caesar, August and Divine Son, High Priest. Jews, you probably understand and remember from the Old Testament, are forbidden to make images of anything that might be construed as an idol. And here we have an image with an assertion of divinity. The image of Caesar with the assertion that he is divine son, he is high priest. This wasn't just dirty money. This is unholy money. Now, additionally, many saw paying this tax as somehow an admission that Rome had the right to rule. It's one thing to acknowledge Rome is ruling because they're more strong, powerful than we are. But some saw this as indicating that Rome had the right to rule, which the Romans, in part, meant it 
to do. They meant it to be an affirmation of we're ruling and you're being ruled. On a deeper level, if you really want to get what offended people deep down, and some of them may not even, even been able to quite verbalize this, but on the deepest level, the most basic level, this tax had the effect of forcing the Jews to pay for their own impression by the Romans. This tax supported Roman rule over them. This tax supported the Roman government, Roman administration. This tax supported Roman soldiers who would enforce Roman will and Roman law over them. So it was offensive in so many ways. It's interesting to note, talking about this tax, Jesus, uh, he says, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Verse 19, Jesus says, show me the coin used for paying the tax. Jesus calls for the coin in question. He's going to use it as a visual aid. Note, he calls for the coin. Seemingly, he doesn't have one. But they, and, and here we have to understand, it's these Pharisees and Herodians, they had one. And in the temple area, to boot. You know, our... Our text today is eight short verses. It's shaping up a lot like dynamite. This is a loaded question that Jesus is facing. It's a, it's a tricky thing about to go off until, until with very little flourish or ado, Jesus simply, he must have held up the coin, must have held up the coin and asked, whose image? Whose image is this? And it's kind of a rhetorical question, but he got the answer back. Caesar's. No, well, then give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And you got to think that somebody's rubbing her hands together like, ooh, we got him. Give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. Jesus takes their yes-no question and he turns it around. He flips it upside down so that it's not an either or, but rather it's a yes and and in so doing here, he diffuses their dynamite. Verse 22 says that they, they leave amazed and seemingly speechless. So obviously, they're, they're stunned. They don't know what to think. There are plenty of other times where somebody came to Jesus and thought they had him and, and, and really laid it to him. And then Jesus turned it around and didn't get me. And, and that person went away angry and upset and bitter. Now, the, they're just like, what do we do? Wow, what an answer. But even as Jesus diffuses this situation over this particular question, it seems like if, if they see it, he's handing them back a, he's maybe handing them back a, a bag of fireworks that they really ought to deal with if they recognize what it is that, that he has just said. See, the question to Jesus, is it right to pay, means just that. It needs to pay, like a, a transaction. I want to buy a quart of strawberries. It costs $4. Here's $4. Here's your quart of strawberries. It's a transactional kind of thing. The answer that Jesus gives, some translations say pay or give back or give. It's a different Greek word altogether. It's a different Greek word, apodote. And it means to pay back what is owed by obligation. So think about that. You're paying this tax. You're paying this tax. You're paying it because it's an obligation. You're not getting anything for it. When I bought those strawberries, I got strawberries. There's a transaction. You pay this tax, and Jesus is saying it is an obligation. Jesus' answer is that we owe, we owe both Rome and God. That answer is going to lead to an understanding in our faith that many, many understand even still today, developed later in Scripture, that as followers of Jesus, at least for the time being, we have dual citizenship. We have dual citizenship. We are citizens both in the kingdom of God and we are citizens in the kingdom of the world. 1 Peter 2.17, 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, Titus 3.1, Romans 13.1-18, other places tell us and make it clear we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities toward earthly rulers. Like it or not, we have responsibility, obligations to obey, to submit, to pray for, to give respect. 
And it starts with Jesus. Following Jesus, you see, does not excuse us from earthly obligations. Sometimes we wish it was so, but it does not excuse us from earthly obligations. We have to keep them and keep them in the proper perspective. Not that these two things are equal, Caesar and God, uh, but we still, we must keep them both. Obligations we have to Caesar, the obligations that we have to God. We give to Caesar what is Caesar's and we give to God what is God's. I don't know about you here, but for me, it would have been so nice, so nice if Jesus could have gone on just a little bit more here and said, okay, and by the way, here's a handy dandy list. These are the things that you do owe to Caesar. Six, eight, ten, fifteen things, whatever it is. And here are the things that you owe to God. And just list them to take the guesswork out of it for us. But he doesn't. All we can say for sure that we owe is taxes. There has to be more, though. There has to be more. Now, some commentators say that Jesus isn't trying to say more than this, that we owe Rome and we owe God. They'll point out that what we should see here is that besides owing taxes, owing Caesar, and owing God, we should see that man will not, man does not, man cannot outsmart Jesus. He has answers for everything. No matter what it might seem, Jesus is always in control. But it seems like we should see a little bit more here. Now, there is a danger in trying to read too much into the Bible. We can find ourselves in places where we shouldn't. But still, Jesus doesn't give a simple yes or no. There's no simple rule here. Jesus gives us a principle. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So what does belong to Caesar and what belongs to God? While we don't have any clear specifics, Jesus doesn't list, there seems to be something in our text today that it might help us to begin to separate or at least to really think about what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. When Jesus asks for that coin, he asks whose image is on it. The Greek word is icon, E-I-K-O-N. Whose icon, whose image is on on this. And the coin, of course, bears the image of Caesar. It is a thing of Caesar's world. It belongs to him, or it belongs with him. It belongs in Caesar's world. Humankind, you and I, in contrast, according to Genesis 1, 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Somehow, we bear the image of God, and we belong to him, not of this world. Rome meant the poll tax to make a statement about their claim 